All right, I think it's it's six o'clock. We've got a good number of people here. Um, so I think I will just go ahead and get started, um, even though I know there are a lot of people still, so hopefully going to join us tonight. Um, so good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, um, all right, so good evening, everyone. So thank you very much for joining us this evening um, on Zoom. Um, we did not expect as much interest as we've actually gotten. So we're super excited to have many of you joining us and actually still signing in right now. I saw a few names that I actually recognized. So it's nice to virtually be able to see you. Um, it's been a little while. Um, and so thank you for, for maneuvering this digital world with us. We're super excited for tonight and for our partners that are joining us. Um, I'm Marisol Cardenas, I'm a program specialist at Stop Waste. And this evening, we're going to learn a little bit about different ways that we can reduce the climate impacts of wasted food in our own homes and beyond. Um, Stop Waste is really grateful to be partnering with Community Climate Solutions and with Ends and Stems um, on this event to bring you some simple ways to take action in your own home. So some housekeeping just really quickly for this evening. Um, this event is actually going to be recorded. Um, your video and audio won't be shared as, as the people, only people visible um, are, are going to be recorded. So I'm not sure if you've been participated in an event like this before, but um, please do participate in the chat box um, below and, and share any thoughts or connections or additional information that you might have, tips that you have your, from your own home. Um, and then also in Q&A, please feel free to share any questions. We got some really great questions though already from the registration. So thank you for those of you who already shared some of those. Um, we'll have some time at the end of tonight to be able to listen to Chef Allison kind of go through some of those questions. Um, there were some great themes in there. Um, so we will also, if, if your question doesn't get answered tonight, we'll actually be following up on um, via email or through social media. If you don't already follow us, please follow Stop Waste and Ends and Stems um, on social media on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. And hopefully we'll actually be able to answer some of those questions there. Um, so I think we're ready to get going here. Um, let's see, so just a quick review of our agenda for this evening. Um, I'm going to be doing a really quick review of the problem of wasted food. Why is this even an issue that we're concerned about? Um, I'll hand it off then to Chef Allison, who's going to be showing us some great things that we can do in our own households um, and our own kitchens to reduce our climate impact and reduce the amount of food that we're throwing away. Um, and then we'll move on to um, Patrick Journey from Community Climate Solutions, who's going to show us this really awesome platform and a way to be able to participate and track um, our climate impact and the reductions that we can make in our own homes. And again, I mentioned earlier that we will um, have some time at the end to do some Q&A with Chef Allison. So just to get started, I wanna look at who Stop Waste is or introduce Stop Waste. We are a public agency in Alameda County, serving the county, 17 cities, two sanitary districts and 18 public school districts. Um, our agency works with our cities and community partners to help residents, businesses and schools reduce waste and use resources more efficiently. And I wanted to start by actually looking at how big this picture is of and, and the tremendous amount of food that's actually going to waste. Um, and a report by ReFed just released actually a couple of weeks ago um, estimates that in 2019, nearly 35% of food in the United States went unsold or uneaten. So while a small percentage of this food was actually donated or composted, the majority, 24% of that total, um, or 54 million tons, actually ended up as food waste sent to the landfill, incineration, down the disposal, or simply left to rot in the fields. And so when we look at food waste, we're not actually just looking at the food, but we're looking at all the wasted and wasting the embodied energy and the resources that were required to grow, harvest, package, transport, and distribute that food to our tables. Um, the numbers here show actually the percentage of resources that are wasted due to food loss and waste in the United States. Um, it's 21% of fresh water, 19% of cropland um, devoted to growing food that's actually never even eaten. Um, and if food waste were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases next to China and the United States. Um, so where is this wasted food actually coming from? ReFed found that the largest contributor again to house is households. Um, which is a bit surprising, I think, to, our, to us initially, and then I'm sure to many of you. Um, and it's followed by the places that we actually purchase and consume food. Um, you'll see a list of those down below there. 
Uh, so according to the 2019 refed roadmap to reducing wasted food in the US, close to 65% of wasted food comes from consumer facing businesses and households. And the good news is that that's actually down from 83% from a report that they did in 2016. Um, and we wanna recognize that there are larger systemic issues contributing to the problem of wasted food. And as an agency, we're focusing on reducing household and commercial food waste through upstream solutions that prevent surplus food from being generated and recover the do and, or donate surplus edible food. And the Bay Area Quality, Air Quality Management District partnered with Cool California to develop a consumption-based inventory of products and goods using a life cycle approach to assess the emissions generated by the production, shipping, use, and disposal of each product consumed in the Bay Area. And in 2013, food accounted for over 19% of the Bay Area's consumption-based GHG emissions. That's nearly 22 million metric tons um, of CO2 equivalent. So you can see from the graph here um, that some food types like meat and dairy actually result in higher GHG emissions due to all the factors that go into livestock production, including land and feed required and the transportation and processing impacts. Um, the EPA's food recovery hierarchy provides a framework to reduce wasted food by prioritizing the food, saving actions such as prevention and donation um, before considering downstream approaches such as composting and and ideally not landfill. Um, Stop Waste provides resources and assistance to households, schools, and businesses to focus on the top two tiers of the hierarchy, um, which helps reduce the amount of food going to compost or landfill and also diverts edible surplus food to feed people. There's a short-term solution to addressing growing food insecurity in our cities and county, um, where one in five residents seek food from the Alameda County Community Food Bank, two thirds of which those are children. Um, and since the start of COVID, actually food insecurity at the county level is estimated to have grown to 13.5%, up from 8.5% 8, 8 in 2018. Um, so one of the ways we're actually working to support the reduction of wasted food in Alameda County is provide, by providing tips, tools, and resources that actually help you stretch your food budget and make the most of what you actually have. Um, this includes freezer veggie stock, recipes to use leftovers, a detailed storage guide, wearing your fridge to store food, date labels, preserving, and even some composting tips and what can be regrown. So um, please visit us at stopfoodwaste.org to learn more. Um, so now that we've done a quick overview of the problem of wasted food, and we wanna get some, some insight from you all. So I'm gonna pass it on actually to Patrick from, from Community Climate Solutions to help us facilitate a fun kind of interactive activity, so. Hello, um, can we get it so my video is showing? There we go, all right. Um, hi everyone, my name is Patrick. I am the city program manager with Community Climate Solutions. And we are gonna take some, just a couple of minutes to um, see what your thoughts are on what the biggest challenge is that you faced in reducing food waste. So how this works is um, you can either click on the link that is posted in the chat at pollev.com, um, or you can take out your cell phones and text, we renew at 902 to this number. What happens when you click on either of those is you have the opportunity to put a message in um, it could be one word or it could be a phrase of what is the biggest challenge you face in reducing food waste. So, you know, one answer that I'm guessing we'll see is time. Maybe you're running out of time or, or maybe you're forgetting your food. So um, please take a minute to pull out your phone or click on that link and submit um, your reasons for what the biggest challenges you face in reducing food waste. And when you text this link, um, we do not keep your number, you're, you do not get any future texts. So it's just for this specifically. So we can see some responses coming in, time and energy, education, getting things lost in the freezer. Another uh, participant wrote education or eating all the food that we buy. Forgetting what's in my fridge. Not knowing what you can freeze how to save veggies like lettuce, not wanting to eat those leftovers, not enough time, forgetting about items or not getting to them fast enough, cooking fatigue, very poetic, 
not knowing what to cook or planning ahead, education. So we'll give another 30 seconds here, and then we're gonna go on to the second question. Um, and for the second question, you can keep the same link or text the same number. Um, so you won't have to switch anything, not eating my veggies, buying bulk from Costco. Time flies. Buying small is difficult if you live alone. All right, so we're gonna move on to um, the second question. For the second question, what you'll want to ask or answer, sorry, um, is food items that often go bad on you. So this, it could be a specific item. And for this one, this is going to turn into a, a word cloud. So for this, you'll wanna write, if it's, a, if it's two words, you'll wanna write a hyphen between, like cherry, tomato, you would connect the word together. Um, so here you can put in any kind of foods that oftentimes at the end of a week or right before you grocery shop or when you're cleaning out that fridge, you find like, you know, haven't, haven't made it. Um, and so the, the food that most people find goes bad will get bigger as time goes on. So you can put in as many uh, different specifics as you'd like. Seems like lettuce is currently the, the leading culprit. Spinach, lettuce, leftovers, avocados. There's only a short window when an avocado is really good. So this is great. Our expert on the video will be able to address some of these uh, big culprits that you all find oftentimes are the ones going bad. All right, we're gonna give it 30 more seconds before we move on. All right, so Marcel, would you like to um, Take it back and, and introduce the next speaker. Great, thank you so much, Patrick. That's super cool. It's actually still moving. Um, thank you for facilitating that. It's a beautiful activity to be able to see and see all of the different things that, that we're all struggling with. I think we can all identify. Um, so to help us actually in our kitchens um, and walk us through some really good practical tips for, for taking action again on some of these um, items is actually um, Chef Allison Mountford, who is the part or the founder and CEO of Ends and Stems, which is a meal planning service designed to reduce household food waste and stop the effects of climate change. Allison turned 15 years of professional chef and entrepreneurial experience into a solution to help eliminate both weeknight dinner stress and food waste in one clever step. Thank you. Um, Stop Waste is proud to call Allison an official chef partner of our Stop Food Waste campaign. She's lending her expertise to help us make the most out of our food, save money, and make cooking easier. So thank you for being here, Chef Allison. We're excited to see you. Hi, thank you for having me. Thanks, everybody, for showing up tonight. Um, I could go in a million directions right now. I actually have a set of topics that I want to discuss, but that word cloud was so cool. I actually took a video of it. And I was watching as everything came in and there was only one thing that came up on there of all of those words that I couldn't think of a way to put in the freezer and that's sprouts. But almost everything else can go in the freezer. I guess maybe not lettuce, but lettuce is also the most wasted food in my kitchen because I just don't like lettuce, it turns out. I keep thinking I should buy it, but it turns out I don't really love lettuce. You can put lettuce in smoothies, but now what I've decided to do instead of buying a whole head of lettuce is if I do buy it, I just buy a very tiny amount of it. So let me back up a second. Um, we will, between um, ends and stems and stop waste, we will come up with um, lots of great content about the questions that you showed up here with tonight. And I'm definitely also going to dig into that word cloud. Um, so I have been a professional chef in San Francisco Bay Area for almost 20 years. 
I have done a lot of private chefing, which makes me uniquely qualified to talk about what's happening in your kitchen. And it's actually how I got into the business that I have now, which is meal planning for busy families, because I cooked in thousands of people's homes. And I would often cook while their families were making dinner or while they were having a dinner party. And I would see kind of what came and what went. A lot of times I even was, was buying groceries for people and, and bringing it to their homes. So I think as chefs go, you know, I haven't spent my career in a restaurant. I've actually done it in, I'm a professional home cook, I guess you could say. So when we talk about why food gets wasted at home, by far the number one most basic reason is because we bring home too much food. It can really be distilled down to that. Whether that means you thought you were going to cook something tonight and then you didn't because time is one of the big issues. It really comes down to you still brought food home and you ran out of time to cook it, but you knew that was gonna happen. We all know that's going to happen. So what I am um, making my expertise is really how to write a meal plan and how to also demystify writing meal plans. My company will literally write a meal plan for you, but you can also do it on your own if you don't want to use my recipes or you know work with my company, that's fine. You can write your own meal plan. So we have on the Stop Waste website, actually, um, we have this great template you can use to make a shopping list. And it also helps guide you to making a meal plan. You can obviously just do this on a piece of scratch paper as well. But a couple really important things about this, if you want to start at the top, which is reduction. So first of all, as you run out of groceries in your home kitchen, you always want to write that down. So you can see I kind of have a list going. I have two little kids. Neither of them can actually spell or write yet. But as soon as your kids are old enough to be able to write things down, get everyone in your house invested in writing down what they use up. So typically in a household, there's one person who nutritionists and experts call like the nutritional gatekeeper. So this is the person who says, hey, family, household, we're out of eggs, we're out of bread. And that's the person who decides that it's time to go to the grocery store. That person does a lot of invisible labor and it's moms. It's like, we can just be honest. It's by and large, it's, it's just moms still in 2020, we might be CEOs or, you know, working a long day. It is still overwhelmingly moms who are the ones deciding when and what food comes into the house. So if you get a list like this going and get everybody capable of writing down and getting their own food to write down what you run out of. This is a great way to start your family grocery list so that you aren't at the grocery store wondering how many eggs did we have left? Do I really need to be buying these today? You can keep a running list. Um, this is really old school. I feel like my mom used to do this when I was growing up in the 80s. Um, but the second part of this is writing down ideas about what you want to eat in the upcoming week. So if you go to write a meal plan, it feels like, let's say you're headed to the grocery store and you're like, okay, let's figure out what am I going to eat this week? It can feel like the same feeling as writer's block. Um, if you've ever you know, tried to write or anything, but you know that feeling. So if you keep a separate list that's constantly compiling ideas, these ideas will just pop up randomly. It's actually a scientific fact that humans think the best when we're in motion or when we're doing something else as opposed to when we're sedentary. So maybe you're watching TV or maybe you flipped through a magazine and saw an ad. Maybe you saw an ad on Instagram and thought, oh, pasta carbonara, I forgot about that. That's one of my favorites. You'll remember that you thought of something, but when you actually need to buy the groceries for it, it will be harder to remember it. So if you keep a list of ideas, whether it's on your phone or you know manually, it will help you when you come to write a meal plan. The next part of writing an easy meal plan comes from what you already have. So before you go to the grocery store or write your meal plan, get your actual produce drawer. And also, yes, this is my produce drawer, but this is definitely like the Instagram webinar, um, going online version of my produce drawer. I did clean this before the event. I usually have a paper towel or a cloth or something in the bottom. And you know, the little bits of the broccoli broke off, but this is a really good moment every week when you kind of take a look in your drawers to also clean it out. Because if you have things that are kind of rotting in here or gone bad, it adds moisture, which then makes things rot faster. So this is also sort of part of just your, your maintenance of making sure to store everything. There are also great resources 
on the Stop Waste site and also on the Climate Solutions Challenge, which Patrick will take us through further later, that can teach you where to store things in your fridge. Storage obviously means you can have things longer, it doesn't go bad as quickly, and then we address the time issue. So it all fits together, right? So before I write a meal plan for the week, just based on what sounds good or what I ran out of, I also want to look at what I have. So broccoli stems, I should turn this into something, right? I don't want these sitting around for an extra week. This avocado is in my fridge because it's been hanging out, so it's the softest. This needs to be turned into something. Maybe I turn it into avocado mousse because it's a little bit too soft, or maybe I puree this with cilantro and turn it into you know, a creamy salsa or something like that. I have half a cucumber that needs to be eaten. These go slimy really quickly. So I would make a list of all these things along the side here so that I know what I have. I'll just put that to the side. Um, oh, another good one. I found this potato that kind of jumped out of the potato drawer. So now it's just one lone potato. What do I do with that? So I put all these things together and I think, well, the broccoli I specifically saved because I, you could see I chopped the florets off it. One of the vegetables my kids will eat really well is um, broccoli florets. So we make them a lot, but it does mean I end up with a lot of stems. So I love the broccoli stems. I practically named my company after them, Ends and Stems. So with something like this, you do kind of learn about each vegetable newly, but you can see this has been in my fridge for a while. It's dry, this is really hard, but up here it's still very tender. So I would usually just chop off just a little bit from here. So let's say this part is now going into the compost, but all of this is gonna become a meal. So with this, I would either shred it and make like a broccoli salad. I really like it with like a yogurt or buttermilk ranch dressing. But also I'm looking at this potato and I'm thinking I love bro broccoli cheddar soup. And I really love it when there's a potato in it because it makes it creamier without adding a lot of dairy to it. So these make a lot of sense to me. And I will note that down. Okay, this week, one of the things we definitely have to make is broccoli soup because I have these bits. And then you'll probably get to a point where you've used up some of the stuff that you have um, and then you can start adding in new recipes that you'll shop for freshly. And if you always do a little bit of a combination, I feel that it also addresses the emotions of eating, right? I got into eating and cooking. Yeah, that's accurate, actually. I got into eating and because of that, I got into cooking. I got into cooking because I wanted to explore foods that were not available in my hometown. I saw them on TV and I thought, ooh, wouldn't it be fun to make this? I've never tasted it. So we're into eating as a society. I think we really are more than we are into cooking. So meal planning is also very emotional and that's okay. It can be, we just need to plan for our emotions. So what we also need to do is check our calendar for the week. Um, I knew I had this event tonight. My kids are downstairs eating burritos that we bought because we planned that tonight would be burrito night. It's fun for everybody. They love getting burritos. It's easy for my husband and myself when we don't have to cook tonight. But the difference is planning when you're going to get takeout because it's a busy night means that my fridge doesn't have a lot of leftovers or things kind of wasting in there. Where we go wrong or feel stressed about it or even guilty about it is because we bought fresh salmon to eat tonight. But when we bought that, we weren't thinking through that Wednesday was going to be a strange night for us this week. And I was definitely not going to have time to cook salmon. So you can, it doesn't have to be, you know, in, in the modern world, it doesn't have to be that you cook every single meal, but only bring home, purchase the food and bring it into your house when you know you'll be able to eat it. That also saves money and it's the best way to prevent food waste. One other thing I wanna say really quickly before I move on, I also every maybe other week, I look in my pantry and I see, you know, I have a little bit of pearl couscous that I need to use. I have these red lentils. There's not that many left. It would be really great to use these up. So maybe my broccoli soup actually with the potato becomes a red lentil soup. And instead of pureeing it afterwards, maybe I dice the potato and dice the broccoli stem and add it to my red lentils. And now this jar is clean and I can go, you know, either buy more red lentils or buy something else to fill up this jar. So if you look at your perishables every time before you go shopping, you can look at your stable shelf stable pantry items, maybe every other time or just do a kind of a quick cursory glance 
but then once a month or so, you can really dive deep into the back of your pantry to make sure nothing gets lost there forever. I heard someone say that initially that things get lost. And then you also, well, we're going to talk about your freezer in a minute. You also make sure when you're meal planning about once a month is, is enough to look in your freezer. And this is where if you, let's say I make this soup, I know I have more than my family will eat. You know, I'll, I'll store it in mason jars in my freezer. And then I know I have this in there for later. So you can either you know, store a big batch and say, okay, we'll have this again for dinner later. Or um, I used to have a lot of clients who would pay me to make soup and store it in little portions like this, because this is great for lunch. You can kind of just grab and go for lunch. So from there, you can combine what you have, what you need to use, the things that are going bad most quickly, or things that have been laying around with the emotions of your calendar, and also what you want to eat. Because one of the other reasons, aside from time, that we all know we don't end up following through in our plans is when we planned to make something we know we don't want, like lettuce. When I buy lettuce and think, oh, I should be healthy and eat salads, I look at the lettuce and I go, or not, we're going to have something else. So just be honest with yourself and it makes it easier to follow through. Okay. So freezing, pickling, and cooking. So these are three of the easiest ways, I think, to preserve things that are kind of nearing the end. Um, and you'll see also when we get to the Climate Solutions site, they have challenges that you can do for each of these, which make it really fun to kind of gamify. Okay, like how can I serve the wonky fruit? You can make a pickle out of it. How can I store food pop properly? So that folds into your meal plan. Or how can I share this food with somebody else? Um, you can donate things out of your pantry, or you can, you know, take a dish to your neighbor and maybe they'll bring it back to you later. So, but we're going to talk about pickling for a second. So pickling is one of my favorite ways to use either a produce that is nearing its end or maybe just random bits. So, you know, I have kind of a, a random bit of a carrot. I have two pieces of asparagus because it was, must've been busy looking in my drawers and I didn't notice these two pieces. And then also we do a lot of broccoli and cauliflower because my kids like that. So often I'll end up with kind of these random bits and things. So making pickles, these are refrigerator pickles. It's super, super easy. You just need a jar or Tupperware. Make sure it's really, really clean. You don't want anything weird in there. And then I have a pickle liquid. So you can't really see much. It just looks clear. But basically, the most basic refrigerator pickle liquid is equal parts vinegar and water. That's it. At, at minimum, that is all you have to put in there. This is distilled vinegar, white vinegar, but... Um, uh, cider vinegar is also amazing for this. You could even use red wine vinegar. And I also love rice vinegar. And because they are refrigerator pickles, there's not much science um, happening here. And there's not much chance that anything could go wrong. At most, what you will end up with is a vegetable that doesn't taste pickly enough, as opposed to, and this is a very important distinction, as opposed to trying to actually can anything and leave it on your shelf at room temperature, you can make yourself really sick. So this is not advice for that. You need to actually learn how to can. Different class, super fun, but not this. So this is very easy. One part water, one part vinegar, and then I like to add a little bit of salt and sugar for each. So into about a cup and a half water and a cup and a half vinegar, I have a tablespoon of each. And then we will just make a mix. And what's super fun about pickling is you can kind of cut them into any shape. You can do any combination of vegetables that you like. I'm gonna do carrot sticks here and we'll just fill them in. Um, you can make, you can do corn is one that I love in the summer when you have a lot of fresh corn on the cob and you don't know what to do with all the kernels. Um, you can lightly pickle it and taste amazing like a hot dog topping or a sausage topping. Um, we'll throw these in here. I even have the little bits of the stems from the cauliflower, which are super edible and taste delicious. And then I'll do my little asparagus here. If you are a Bloody Mary type person, pickled asparagus um, in your Bloody Mary is super great. And then we can spice this up in any way. Here, I have a couple different here. We can spice these up in any way that really inspires you. You can really start to have fun with it. So parsley, um, one of the questions that we got actually was whether or not you could use the herbs 
uh, stems for anything? And the answer is definitely yes on soft herbs like this. So these parsley herbs, um, I'm sorry, these parsley stems and cilantro stems are super flavorful. They might be a little bit strange if you were just to eat them like this, but chopped up, they taste really, really great. And they also impart a lot of flavor. So you could put this into, you might tie a little um, string around it and put this into your soup while it's cooking. You can definitely put this into stock, but also if you were making something like a chimichurri or a pureed herb sauce, like an Italian salsa verde, these stems are really flavorful, but I like them in the pickles too. So I would use the stems there. And then we can do a wide variety. This is a fennel seed, which brings a nice kind of anise flavor. That's really nice in pickles. You can do dried chives, bring a nice oniony flavor. And then one of my favorites is also to do um, mustard seeds. So I have black mustard seeds here and you can drop those in. Um, and if you like a hot pickle, you can definitely put in um, like red pepper flakes. You can even put in jalapenos and make pickled jalapenos would be super delicious. And then you basically just, let's see if I can pour this without making a huge mess. You basically just cover it like that. And that's it, you go all the way up to the top. And what's also cool about this, um, super duper, this is like advanced level unlocked. If you can convince your family to keep their fingers out of here and use a clean utensil, you can actually reuse this pickling liquid. So my biggest concern would be human contamination, but as far as food contamination, there's none. You can keep using this pickling liquid over and over again. And these are just raw vegetables and vinegar uh, with a little bit of spices. So you can eat these right away. I would say for the big hearty vegetables that I used here, these are gonna be best maybe in about 48 hours or so, but, one of my favorite springtime pickles. These are crazy pickles, strawberries, right? Okay, so strawberries, let's see. These all actually look pretty good, but especially if you get strawberries that don't look quite as good, you can see a little bit of the white on here. If you put your strawberries in there and cover that with pickling liquid. Now these, I would not let sit for many days, but if you wanna let these pickle for a couple of hours, um, they make just a really cool combination of flavors. It's like sweet and tangy and it tastes great with granola. I think it tastes great over strawberry ice cream. Um, really interesting. You could put that on yogurt. And then one of the other ones I was going to say really quickly, where'd my potato go, is you can actually pickle potatoes. So I would peel this and dice this into little cubes and one of, um, one of the fanciest restaurants in San Francisco actually does lightly pickled french fries so i would take these this is like easy home level but you could do raw potatoes like this cover them with the pickle liquid let them pickle overnight and then the next day dry them off and roast them and you get roast them with like olive oil and a little bit of just a little bit of salt because they're in the brine and you just get a really interesting roast potato so there is almost nothing that can't be saved by pickle um, if you look online for recipes about pickling, a lot of times you'll see that they recommend using only the best and freshest produce. I literally cannot figure out for the life of me why that's always the recommendation. I mean, on one level, you know, there is the whole thing about chefs where what you produce is only as good as the ingredients that went into it. But as long as these were good ingredients in the first place, this is an amazing way to save it. Um, so real quick, I just want to touch on the freezer. Um, as I said on that word cloud, everything I saw on there can be frozen and you just need to work on your methods of freezing. So if we have berries, what I would do for berries, for example, is take a tray like this. I would hull the berries. I'm doing this in the lazy way because I don't have my small knife. And I would take huge berries maybe and divide them, small berries like this. And if you set, this works for almost anything that you don't want to have sticking together at the end. If you freeze them for about 45 minutes to an hour separate, right? Like this isn't gonna fit in your freezer for long-term storage, but what it will do is freeze the outsides of them. And then you can put these all in a Tupperware next to each other, but they will not become one big blind, uh, giant block this way. So that way, if you wanna go in and just pop out one or two strawberries, they'll be separate. And it's a much easier way to freeze things. It's actually what they do in warehouses, like when they freeze peas. That's like, if you get frozen peas, you don't get one big block unless you brought it home, let it defrost and then froze it together as one big block. But initially all the pieces are separate. So that is a great technique for 
anything you want to freeze to avoid the big freezer burn block. So if you're bringing home meat and you only want a little bit, separate out the pieces, let them freeze separate. And once they have the icy coating on the outside, then you can put them back together. And then my, um, I feel like I want to get a bumper sticker, maybe even a tattoo that says, when you put something in the freezer, you have to label it. Um, my favorite thing ever is to use the blue painter's tape. It doesn't come off in the freezer. I am so guilty of saying, well, I'm a professional. I will know what this barbecue sauce looks like later. I don't, I never do. I always forget frozen garbanzo beans don't look anything like unfrozen garbanzo beans. So write it down, put it on your list perhaps, and it'll be so much easier to come back around to it afterwards. Um, okay, great. I'm gonna pass it back. I will see you again for question and answer afterwards. Hello. Wow, I'm so, oh, do you wanna go Marcel? No, I just wanted to introduce you. Can I introduce oh, you really quickly, Patrick? I'm sorry. No, I just oh, want to no, be great. able to say who you are. Um, so I think we thank you, Chef Allison, because that was wonderful. We always learn something new. We did a run through of this and we didn't learn all of that. So it was really great to learn more. Um, but I just want to introduce Patrick. He's getting his slides ready anyway. So um, Patrick is a city program manager at Community Climate Solutions, which is a nonprofit that partners with cities and counties to help them enact climate solutions. And they developed a platform that makes it simple, easy, and fun to learn about solutions and specific actions they can take to lower their impact and save money. The platform includes custom analytics, resources, how-to guides, gamification, and social tools to motivate action. So we're super excited to see this and hear about it. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks for letting me jump in. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I am so excited after Allison's presentation to try pickled French fries. That's very intriguing. Uh, so we're actually going to start off my part with a, a bit of engagement. So there's going to be three questions that come up. There's no pressure if you get the wrong answer, um, but we just want to hear your thoughts. We're going to talk about some of the main concepts at hand that caused uh, us to develop our platform. So the first question um, is, what percentage of U.S. emissions come from five basic and common household activities, which include transportation, home heating, so the way you heat your house or heat your oven, um, electricity, food, and then waste. So you should be able to uh, click either 10, 20, 30, or 40%. Um, and so select your best guess for what percentage of emissions come from these five common things we do every day. And then it looks like you can guess ahead. So you can do that if you'd like, or you can wait till the, till the first answer is revealed. So wait another couple seconds if people want to put in their best guess for the first question. But you all are a smart audience because the answer is 40%. I think for a lot of people, this is actually quite surprising. It's easy to feel like our individual impact doesn't account for anything. You know, there's all these big corporations. How can we play a role? But when we all work together, we actually have a really big role that we get to play in reducing emissions. And one of those, obviously, that we've been talking about today is how we can reduce our food waste. Um, so the second question is whether or not people care. How many people are actually concerned about climate change? I think it's really easy to feel like this is a polarized issue. Um, and so let's see of the percentage of Americans, which percent are concerned and want to help. So I'll give a couple more seconds if people are just getting to the second question. The answers are 33, 50, 66, or 80%. Right now, it's a very close tie between one third and two thirds of Americans for your best guess. Um, so the answer for this is 66%. 66% of people, in fact, feel a personal responsibility to act on climate. This is uh, research done by Yale in 2020. Um, and so I think it's, it's really empowering to know that not only do we all care, but over half of Americans feel personal responsibility to act and want to do something. And then the final question is what we can do. So are there affordable solutions that we can implement for all five of these common household activities? And the answer is if you guessed any of them, you are correct. <laughs> yes, most definitely. And I'm sure you can't wait to learn more. So I'm gonna end the poll now. And what I'm gonna do is actually just take some time to show you 
the um, show you the platform itself that we developed to help people who have a big role to play and care about climate change, learn about what they can do to reduce their impact. So the, we have a national kind of central page called We Renew, where um, you can go into your state and your city. So I live in, um, I live in Berkeley. So I'm gonna click in for California and Berkeley. And when I click into this, it takes me to my localized landing page. So wherever you live in the country, you can join and participate in this challenge. And we have local landing pages for the specific communities that you live in. Um, that's also because we have specific info in the back end uh, data analytics for your community to make this really accurate and personalized to you and your area. So when you join the challenge, there are three main things that you do. The first is you complete your energy profile where you uh, input basic info about your home to understand your household carbon footprint. Then you can discover and take actions to reduce your impact. And then you can work together in your communities, whether that's a book club, a group of friends, or a community of people who all care about reducing food waste. Um, and so these are kind of the three main steps and I'll show them in a little bit more detail. For the energy profile, the step is optional, but it's highly recommended because it's really insightful. It helps you understand your household footprint and it gives us the ability to personalize recommendations based on your specific home. You'll put in basic info like the kind of appliances you use and how often, the way you heat and cool your house, your electricity use, your utility info, all the different ways you get around, etc. When you complete this, it takes about five or 10 minutes, you'll be able to see your starting impact. So this is your household footprint. Um, based in metric tons of the equivalent of CO2. And you can see how you compare as well. So you can see how you compare to your immediate community and the US as a whole. And we've even included here a goal that's great to keep in mind. It's in line with the US Paris Accord, the UN Paris Accord to reduce emissions by 80%. And so this is really the first step, which is just gaining insight into your household impact. And then the big thing to do on the platform is to take action. So there's over 90 actions on the site, um, <clears throat> but since we're focusing on food waste, I'm gonna show you all where the food waste ones are. There's also uh, great actions to reduce your water or energy use or uh, get around more sustainably or even get more involved in your community. So let's check out the one action that we spent a lot of time learning about today, which was how we can better store it, serve it, serve it and share it to minimize waste. Um, one thing that may be a surprise for you all is the average family in the U.S., a family of four, throws out 45 to 60 cups of food a week. Um, so we can make a really big impact in reducing our food waste. So for this, you gain some basic information and then you can see the impact here. You can see the impact both on your savings and then also on the environment. One point is one ton of carbon or 10 gallons of water if it's a water action. And so depending on the way you take this action, so you can actually do an audit and measure your food waste and then measure it later on. Um, if you were to reduce five cups of food waste a week, you would see a different impact than if you reduced at a greater amount. And then we have here a lot of the same helpful tips that we've reviewed, but that are still great to check out, um, like how to best store your food or serve it smart, et cetera. And we've even plugged in local resources from your city, your county, or your state that are relevant to your specific community uh, that you can take advantage of to help you take that action. When you take actions, they all add up on your dashboard. And so you can see over time the collective impact that you'll have by taking you know, one action to reduce your electricity bill and one action to reduce your, your food waste. And you'll be able to see how this affects your savings. Uh, so the average family that participates can save well over $1,000 in the program um, just by taking actions in the key categories. And then uh, you can reduce your impact between 10 to you know, upwards of 50% if you, if you uh, really deeply engage. And so the, the big thing that we're here to talk about is how we can all work together. So we have created a community page where you all who've come here tonight to learn about food waste and how you can minimize it um, can join. And so you can see what other people are doing. People can post you know, questions or ideas that they have. And when people have joined, we'll be able to see the collective impact of everyone joining together. So I'm gonna post in the chat right now, um, this link. And so if you have not made an account yet, you should click on this link and um, 
put it into your, your web browser and join. If you've already made an account, so you have an account in some part of the country, you can click on that link and it will have you automatically join this community group page. So if you're interested in participating in this and seeing the impact we can all make, we set a goal with Stop Waste to have about 100 members join this page. Um, and so if you also have friends or family that you think would be interested in taking action, then you can always um, invite them via this link. Everyone's info is private on the page, so you can't see like specific actions a household takes, but we can see what we all do when we work together. So we'll, it'll be able to add up really impressively when we all uh, take just a couple of actions in our own home. And so what I'm gonna do is show you what it looks like to sign up. And then we're gonna give you all a couple of minutes, a minute or two to actually sign up right now. It's really straightforward and simple. You just put in whatever email you use, you create a password, you can create a household name. This could be like the Montfort family, or this could be Edith home if you live on Edith street, whatever you'd like. And then you put in your name and your city, and then you create the account. And so it's as simple as that. And that's the first step. Um, so there's just a couple of steps to getting engaged today, um, creating your account. If you decide to join our Stop Waste team, where we can see our collective impact, you'll have joined it by clicking on the custom invite link. And then you'll have the opportunity to discover your impact. If you'd like to complete the energy profile, we highly recommend it. Um, because then when you create a plan and choose actions, you can see the specific impact of those actions based on your household home. And so with the final slide, um, there are two things to do right now. So that's create an account, and then you can start taking food waste actions. So while you're pulling up that, I'm just gonna quick show you what it looks like to take an action. So if you were to take an action in food waste and you wanted to choose the wonky fruit, you would click on the action and you would uh, get started. So there's a place here where you can click get started and you say, you know, this is a new action. I'm just starting to buy wonky fruit from the grocery store and I'm, I'm gonna do it this month. And then at that point, um, you can mark it as complete when you've completed the action. And so when you mark it as complete and say the way that you're going to take it, it'll start adding up the impact on your dashboard. So our challenge to you all is to try to take three actions by Earth Day. So just a couple of actions can make a really big impact if we all work together. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to throw it back to Allison for um, some question and answers. I love seeing that. I signed up the other day and I think it's just so cool to get the instant feedback, like the, you know, we're taking these individual actions, but it's so easy to feel like we're in a silo or we don't, especially this year, right? You don't have visibility into what your literal neighbors or your community are doing. So adding a piece where you actually get feedback just makes it so much more approachable. So um, I just answered a bunch of questions in the Q&A. So if you asked a question, um, they're all kind of answered in there and you can kind of go back over what people said. But I was also so encouraged by all the questions that were submitted by people on signing up. So there were just two or three that I wanted to go over uh, quickly. They could probably all be a webinar on their own. Um, but one that came up from a lot of people I have um, from Carol and Felix, who I believe is here. My son's name is Felix. So I'm going to answer your question um, was about making stock. So um, he asked about adding the stems of the herbs and the cilantro to making soups and stocks and sauces. Um, and absolutely, I covered that a little bit, but definitely a, the most classic pristine French you know, inventors of the chicken stock, as they would probably call themselves, always has um, herbs and herb stems in there. You can just throw the whole thing in. If you have rosemary or thyme or even oregano, anything with a woody stem that isn't like green and watery, if you snap it, you probably want to tie a little piece of kitchen twine around it so that you can remove it afterwards if you're putting it into a super stew. If it's stock, you're just going to drain it anyway, so you can just go ahead and throw it in. But um, Carol had asked about uh, preventing things from going in the compost by putting them into stock first, which is a really great question because when we go back to that hierarchy pyramid, we really want to get the most uses out of something before we just put it into the compost. So um, we used to joke in my cafe that I had for a little while that stock was basically just garbage water, which sounds gross, 
but the restaurant industry is a little bit gross. Um, <laughs> if you've, you know, ever watched any of the behind the scenes, um, but you would basically take the last bits and turn it into something flavorful and amazing. It's also why we all love cooking because we really get to, you know, create, it feels like alchemy a little bit. So things that you would typically put in the compost that are actually great in stock, onion skins, garlic peels. Let's see if I have some, um, all of these, when you peel the onion, they make the stock taste fantastic. Um, some other things that you might not think of potato peels, and the um, insides of hard winter squashes, like you know pumpkin or butternut squash, the seeds and the innards all go into the stock to make it flavorful. What's important to sort of think about as you're putting your stock together is what you want it for later. So if you're making an all purpose, let's say you're not a vegetarian, you're making an all purpose chicken stock, you might prefer to keep that simple so that the flavors in there are very adaptable to whatever recipe you try to make with it later. But if you're making something that's like, let's say maybe you're making like a pumpkin curry later, putting in pumpkin seeds would only enhance that flavor. So it makes sense in that stock. But if you were going to make a, an asparagus risotto, you may or may not want the flavor of pumpkin in there. So it's useful to kind of um, separate what you want to do with the stock later, or just make something really basic. Uh, citrus peels taste great in stock. Broccoli stems are amazing in stock. Um, if you don't cook it too long and, um, you know, any, like the garlic skins, I I'm not sure if I already said that the tops of leeks, um, all of those things can have another life making your stock come to life as well. The other big thing to watch out for when putting things into stock is if it makes it bitter or if anything overtakes the flavor. So something like putting a jalapeno in your stock might make it too spicy. And then that would be a little bit weird later or be peppers in general um, tend to make it bitter if you cook it too long. So you can find lists online about what things are good or not to put in your stock. But I would also encourage you if you're just starting out to try to make smaller batches and experiment a little bit and see what you like. The onion skins and my one of my favorite things to add to stock is actually the mushroom stems, but it does turn the stock a very dark color later. So again, back to risotto, if you were making like a, a clear white risotto or maybe a rice congee or something like that, where you want the color of the rice, if you put mushroom stems in it, it will turn it brown. I'm okay with it. I like the flavor of it. I'll probably just add some mushrooms on the top and I would still do that, but you kind of, you know, can, can think those things through. Um, let's see. And then, um, Sorry, I'm looking at my questions there, but the other question was about what to take to the next level. And I do think it's those aromatics, the onions, the, the leeks kind of take it to the next level, a bay leaf, peppercorns, those things all take it to the next level. Um, my next question in the kind of grouping that came up was about getting kids involved. Um, I am a parent and I absolutely get my kids involved. Um, my daughter and I were just talking about drawing pictures about food. We like to have conversations about why you don't waste food. I, whenever possible, show them how food is grown. And when we put things on their plate or when they ask for a snack, I should have brought a real prop and shown you the apple that my daughter just took one bite out of and then left it around lying around. And I can take those moments to have a conversation with her about, you know, how that apple was grown and how much water it took. And they, they understand these things, especially now it's relatively easy to show them pictures of what's happening, but do it in a way that isn't so much a lecture, but really asking them questions and engaging them in it. And um, the question was about, um, doing like an art project or something. We love that idea. We'll come back to that. Uh, but I do think kids really understand these kind of tangible actions. And if your kid likes going outside or playing in puddles, it's really easy to explain that these actions go back to, you know, where they live. And my kids love wild animals. You know, do you want the birds to be free? So they, it kind of can all come back to that. And then third one I'll answer really quickly before we wrap up is about cooking for one. Um, we should do a whole webinar on cooking for one or two people because it is a very different challenge. 
Um, most grocery stores are not working in our favor. They're bundling things. You have to buy way more than you need. My grandmother is 94 and still cooks for herself and she loves asparagus. But if she buys a pound of asparagus, she needs to eat it eight times that week. So this is a case where you either partner up with a friend and split some of these things. Like if you've been time your grocery runs, you can do that. Or you do have to think about some preservation techniques. So if you have to buy a pound of, uh, you know, tomatoes, can you make a tomato sauce and freeze some of it and just have one that's fresh in the moment? Or if you have a recipe that has, let's say you have a sheet pan vegetable dinner and it's calling for six vegetables to be added to it, reduce it down and just only do one or, or maybe two or three vegetables. And then you can have your variety later. So you need to look at variety over the course of maybe a week or a month rather than Monday needs to be different from Tuesday needs to be different from Wednesday and then seek out farmers markets, bulk bins or anywhere where you can buy smaller portions of things so that you can kind of participate in this ultimate reduction action, which is to take less home. But I could talk about cooking for one for a lot longer because it is definitely hard and my sympathies are with you for sure. Um, we'll follow up online, I guess, and answer those questions further. Awesome. Thank you so much, Allison and Patrick, for um, the great presentations. Um, Allison, again, we learned so much from you. Um, and, and we got so many questions from you all, again, through registration and some great ones just tonight in the Q&A and even in the chat as well. So we will make sure, please do keep an eye out on um, social media, um, on Stop Waste and Ends and Stems. We'll try to answer some of those questions in the following weeks. Um, but then also we will plan to send you all an email after this, um, this event tonight that actually has a link to the recording. I know that there was a question about that as well. We are recording tonight and um, we'll send that to you. I know some of this went, we went through a lot of it really quickly. We're trying to fit a lot into one hour we're realizing. So um, we'll send you a recording, some answers to some of those questions. Um, and then make sure that we include the links as well. Cause I see that there's been some questions as well about um, the links to whether it's Stop Food Waste website or Patrick's um, Community Climate Solutions and the page of the specific pages he shared. Um, as well, and, and Allison's Ends and Stems connection too. I know there was some great chat going on in there. So again, thank you so much to Community Climate Solutions, Patrick Journey, and, um, and Allison from Ends and Stems. Um, please do look out. It's also March, March now. Um, we are going into April, which is Earth Month. Um, we'll be sharing a lot of events, um, including things about induction cooking, um, composting, which I know that there were a lot of questions about as well. We'll try to get to those um, in the emails. And, and just in general ways to reduce your climate and, um, and environmental impact. So we appreciate you all being here tonight and thank you again. Please keep an eye out um, for that email from us. Thank you.